should. So, yeah, brilliant. Um, so, yes. So, again, thank you all for coming to this talk, um, The Gable and Rides Again, The History of a Queer Biker with um, Miguel's Inter Solace. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of depth or anything, um, but they are uh, pursuing a PhD at the minute in cultural, social and political thought at the University of Lethbridge um, in Blackfoot Territory. And we also have um, Professor Suzanne Lennon, who is a professor of uh, women and gender studies, also at University of Lethbridge. Um, I said, I'm not going to go into any more depth. I, I, I'm very excited for the talk. So I'm going to pass it um, right on over uh, to you, uh, Miguel. Miguel's into, would you like to go ahead? Are we okay, Miguel? Are we good? Miguel, I think. Yes, got yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I think we've got you finally, yes. Okay, excellent, excellent, okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah can't, well, okay, well, we got audio. It's okay if we don't have the camera. You can see the presentation, right? Uh, yeah, yes, we can. Yes. Okay, all right, okay, we're good, all right. Oh, so sorry about that. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, th thank you to Hannah and Nick and Melissa at Queer Disrupt for this wonderful opportunity to share my research with a much wider community. My goodness, I'm, I'm really, really uh, so, so moved that everyone is, is attending from all over the world today. Um, uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to speak to you from Lethbridge, Alberta, located on Treaty 7 territory today. Um, it is the ancestral land of the Blackfoot Confederacy. I will be reading to you from my paper. Uh, and then I'll be joined by Dr. Suzanne Lennon, uh, who's up in Treaty 6 territory, and we'll have a bit of a conversation on the themes. Um, Dr. Lennon's breadth of expertise is so impressive, and in the past few years, she has managed to resuscitate uh, my passion for queering academia, so I'm very grateful to her for that, and I'm very, very happy to have her here today with us. Um, I have to apologize for my handling of history here. <laughs> Um, uh, I am, you know, I'm actually, I'm not a historian, I'm not a sociologist, I'm actually uh, coming from a, a visual arts background, and just sort of dabbling um, in history and the archives, so I, I just, I ask you to forgive my cavalier use of references and citations, um, so uh, While well, the past five or so years have seen many queer creative writers, visual artists actively engaging with their ancestors and elders via archival research, uh, it wasn't something I ever imagined I would do. Uh, so you can imagine my surprise when a single playing card found in a jacket pocket led me down a twisting maze of microhistorical rabbit holes, uh, each answer leading to more and more questions. Uh, my story begins in San Francisco around 2012. I lived in Oakland at the time and an old friend of mine was in town. We decided to go look for hot guys in the Castro. Uh, I lived, worked, and spent most of my leisure time in the East Bay. Uh, so I was just as disappointed as my friend to find the big bars in the Castro to be full of young corporate twinks. We had a drink at the lookout and at some other bar down the way. We danced to music that felt too young for us, even though we were only in our mid-twenties. <laughs> I think my friends said something about longing for scruffier guys. We obviously should have gone to the Stud or Aunt Charlie's or even the Lex to honor our past dyke selves. I feel like maybe in a way we were hoping to fall through some magic gay Narnia portal into a Tom of Finland fantasy of leather daddies, AIDS-free barebacking and handlebar mustaches. This imaginary is something I, as both an artist and gay trans man, have spent a lot of time thinking about. Last year, I collaborated with another old friend, artist and filmmaker Gerald Blanchard, on a queer art flick titled Letters, in which two queer dreamers play a game of leather-clad cat and mouse. This film drew from the same rich leather imaginary that fed Tom of Finland, pulled from a historical moment which had and continues to have significant overlap with the world of queer motorcycling. 
I and many other bodies in the now continue to be haunted and pulled backward into these histories. In the book, Time Binds, Queer Temporalities, Queer Histories, Elizabeth Freeman discusses a number of ways that homos engage with temporal drag and other processes that have resulted in a rich querying of heteronormative time, both in daily life and processes of self-definition in policy and politics. Perfume Genius's album art, photographed by Camille Vivier, demonstrates a hearkening to this fabled time of gay motorcycles, but filtered through a romantic, sensual, and desirous dreaminess. So yeah, I don't know what kind of time of Finland shit we were hoping for that night in 2012, but we didn't find it. We did, however, decide to go down to the little leather shop in the basement space on Market Street. Worn Out West Second Generation was a small consignment shop that had just moved from its original Worn Out West Castro Street location to a new location on Market Street about a half block down from the lookout. Spoiler, the shop closed, uh, and this is an image of the moving out process from an SF community publication, but I wanted to show this interior picture to give you a sense of the place. The leather shop was attended by a grumpy old white guy with a beard who'd stood behind the counter here uh, and he asked me if I was looking for anything, and I said I was interested in getting a jacket. And I remember the sounds of our shoes on this floor as he showed us where the size smalls were over here on the, on the left there. Um, and I tried on a few jackets. Uh, I suspect it's frowned upon to talk about magicalness in the context of a historical presentation, but there was something magically right about the fit of that jacket. No, it wasn't a custom fit, but something in how the seams rested in the right places on my shoulders and how my elbows fell into the corners of the sleeves just felt good. A leather has this wonderful property of molding to the body of the wearer, which makes vintage jackets especially attractive. They're already broken in and putting one on can be kind of like falling into a different body. So I bought the thing for $140. And having done some research on jackets, I can tell you this jacket is not a remarkable artifact. Uh, it's likely from the 80s. It was probably a medium quality jacket in its time. It's made of genuine leather, which is actually specifically processed uh, cheap kind, cheaper kind of leather. And it's not the higher quality of leathers like horse hide or steer hide. Uh, the lining uh, was torn and pilling. The jacket was definitely loved and well worn. And there were two pinholes in the collar, uh, which made me fantasize about what dyke or leather daddy it may have belonged to but I didn't think much of it at the time. Mostly I was happy to, find a fi to have finally found a leather jacket that actually fit me. So years passed and one night I was getting home from a hookup and I reached for my keys in my pocket. And for a moment, I thought they'd fallen out, but I heard them and realized that a hole had opened up in the pocket lining and my keys were just rolling around inside my jacket. Uh, I'd used the jacket in performances, scenes, and taken it on a couple of trips. So it wasn't surprising that the jacket seam had split but my keys were not the only thing I found that night. At first I thought it was a business card I'd shoved in my pocket at some point, but it wasn't that at all. The thing that came out of my jacket lining was a tattered bicycle brand playing card. It could have been an accident. It could have been modern. It was impossible to tell because of how very worn the card was. The card had been drawn on with the word solitaire and gay villain on the front in a barely legible inscription on the back. I thought it would be easy to date the card based on the design, but I was wrong. For comparison, here are two cards. As you can see, the jokers in the 808 cards have not changed significantly since the 30s. How did this card get into the jacket? And how long had it been there? Did the original owner of the jacket know about it? By this time, I had moved to Alberta and San Francisco was pretty far away. Still, it occurred to me I could call the shop and see if the sale had been a consignment. It was unlikely that the seller had been the original owner, but it was worth a shot. <coughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, Worn Out West had closed in February of 2018. This kind of shocked me. Hipsters managed to keep open consignment shops all the time in large cities, but perhaps in the years since I'd left the Bay, even thrift hipsters were being gentrified out. It was an odd feeling in putting together this paper that I had become a participant in history by buying that jacket from a consignment shop that is no longer there. San Francisco has had an extremely active political landscape uh, around place, having gone through massive economic upheaval, which has been the displacement, which has seen the displacement of multiple communities in the past 15 years. Obviously, we're all participants in history, but we often only recognize this through intensive narrativization of our actions and choices. 
I was not out of clues yet, however. The back of the card had a bit more information on it. There was the inscription, which I could not for the life of me read, but my partner helped me and we decided that I must say love from the smallest or, or slowest, it's either smallest or slowest, it's Seder. I began in the obvious place. I Googled solitaire Seder, and that mostly took me to an interesting crux of contemporary Satanism and game art. But solitaire, uh, uh, you know, like in, in, if in parentheses, in, in brackets, solitaire satyr leather gay villain led me to articles and images related to the satyr's gay motorcycle club. I had not heard of the satyrs uh, before, just knew vaguely about gay motorcycle clubs as being part of the originers of gay leather culture as we know it today. The satyrs are known for being the oldest of the recognized gay motorcycle clubs. Gay motorcycle clubs came about in the post-war era and were in those early days made up of working class war veterans. Often, not always, but often. Motorcycles were cheap and easy to come by in the wake of the war, as were flight jackets and uniform pieces. A lot of discussion exists about these articles of clothing, particularly the muir cap and engineer boots that would fuel Tom of Finland's imagination. While versions of these were used by all sides during World War II, many items in the leather daddy form have roots in German SS officer uniforms. The querying of these items has been an interesting process, a process already beginning in the time of these early cycling groups who were positioning themselves and were positioned by the state as counterculture rebels. Uh, this map is a breakdown of decriminalization of same-sex intercourse in the US. We can see there that Illinois was the first to decriminalize in 1962, with many other states not following suit until the 70s and 90s. The defeat of anti-sodomy legislation in Texas in 2003 marked similar motions in about 12 other states. Note, however, that in many states, the root of these policies still exists within the fabric of the law. Anti-gay laws and policies strongly shaped the creation of gay motorcycle clubs. Uh, the post-World War II years gave rise to the McCarthy era, the Red Scare, and consequently the Lavender Scared. Uh, U.S. conservatives were in power and fueled a moral panic about homosexuality being an invading force of perversity that was infiltrating American culture. Gay bars were raided by police frequently, leaving no safe option for public gay, social, and sexual life. The rise of motorcycle clubs function as a kind of parallel world building. The motorcycle clubs allowed for roving sight for homosexual relation and coming together. Rides to the countryside allowed for gatherings to happen outside of police scrutiny, while sexual encounters and activities or play, as we say, were a common part of these gatherings. These rides or runs also just made space for talking, hanging out, drinking together, and I don't know, holding hands, all within reach of a quick getaway vehicle. I learned much of this from old bikers telling their experiences in Framelines film on the satyrs, which is available to watch on YouTube. Highly recommended. Uh, let me get some water here. So I was very busy procrastinating one night, scrolling through Pinterest of all places, when I found this. There was solitaire. I knew it immediately. And yes, I know in historical research, you aren't supposed to jump to conclusions, but something told me that that had to be solitaire, that that was the same person in the scribbled self-portrait on the card I'd found in my jacket. Now, I studied this photo for a long time. It was taken in May of 1962 and depicted a spring poker run and field meet of the Satyrs and Oedipus motorcycle clubs. Uh, according to interviewees in Scott Bloom's film, Oedipus was a shoot-off group of the Satyrs and had named themselves Oedipus because, quote, Oedipus fucked his mother. I didn't know much about motorcycles, but there was something weirdly miniaturized about Solitaire's ride. You can kind of see it over here. <clears throat> The ghostliness of Solitaire's presence in the photo also made it difficult to parse the bike in the foreground from the bikes in the background. I finally showed this photo to a friend of mine who knows a bit more about bikes than I do. The response was shocking, and once it was said, I, it finally made sense of what I was looking at. Solitaire's ride was not a motorcycle, but a bicycle, as in a pedal bicycle. I was captivated, obsessed. I continued scouring the internet for images. 
Have you ever been obsessed with a person who doesn't have social media, but you know they will be attending a massive protest in New York? And since you can't go because you're in Alberta, you decide to go through every single photo with that protest tag, hoping you will catch a glimpse of the person? As I scan through photo after photo for solitaire, I imagine that this would be what that would feel like if that very specific situation somehow applied to me. And I was rewarded. I began finding solitaire, haunting the edges of photos from the 50s and 60s, aloof, looking away, standing apart in their gay villain jacket. The jacket was still a mystery. Was solitaire a gay villain? Was it the name of their club or club name? And why solitaire? Did they have two names? In the images, I was never quite sure if solitaire was arriving or departing from the frame. They were truly ghostly, and yet it was obvious that people were responding to their presence. What did the other men think? Were they talking about solitaire or ignoring them? Commenting on the strange pedal bike? I had a lot of questions about the pedal bike. How did this even work with everyone else being on motorcycles? I had too many questions and not enough answers. I decided to turn to the real experts, the living archives themselves. Not surprisingly, the Satyrs still had a somewhat recently active archives Facebook page. I sent a message to the page and was pleasantly surprised to hear back within a few days. The administrator posted uh, my images, and that's how I met an old Satyrs member named Mighty Matt, who responded eagerly, saying he remembered Solitaire and would get back to me for an interview. Now, any of you, of course, that have worked with interviewing know that that is the thing you are told just before a very long radio silence. While I waited to hear back from Mighty Matt, I kept researching images. In my search, I kept finding some particularly beautiful images that seemed to be from the same photographer, possibly taken on the same day. The photographer turned out to be one Sylvan Rand, who was not a cyclist himself, but who friend, whose friend invited him to join a weekend run to the country with his friends. Taken in 1967, uh, over a weekend, I believe, the photos showed a tenderness and relaxedness that was a bit different from the other photos I'd seen. I was also struck by how much more racially and age diverse this group of men was compared to the older photos I'd seen, which did have the occasional black rider, but little more. This is one of my favorite photos in the set, just showing these men piled on top of each other, happy and relaxed. And uh, there's this black guy with awesome glasses pinching the nipple of this white guy in an excellent leather cap, uh, who's interestingly wearing an iron cross around his neck. It was fun tracing the same men across different pictures, seeing them at various stages of the weekend. I was doing this when Solitaire suddenly materialized in the background. There was Solitaire relaxing by a post, wearing their gay villain jacket on the same bike. Rand's photo set is quite extensive and I was happy to find Solitaire in at least one other photo. I had so many questions now. Oh, excuse me. Was Solitaire's bicycle a hybrid of some sort? How was Solitaire somehow participating in these runs? It was at this point that I finally heard back from the Tennessean Mighty Matt though he made a point of saying he left Nashville in his late teens for, for the West Coast. Uh, and for his age, which he asked me not to share, the guy was remarkably excited about using new technology. Uh, he didn't always get the names for things right, but he was comfortable using Zoom. The following is an expert from my interview with him, uh, which ended up lasting a couple of hours. Uh, and here he's responding to photos I show him. And uh, just let me know if there's uh, any audio issues here. Yeah, well, yeah, I remember Solitaire. He was uh, he was the little Spanish dude. He he always was chasing around uh, on, on us on his weird little pedal thing. I don't know if he I don't know if he built it or what, but it, it was a strange little vehicle. But he we saw him around. It it wasn't really a bike per se, but it wasn't quite you know not not a bike either. But uh, he we certainly saw him around quite a bit in those days. And so this, what, what days were these, these, this would have been like the 1960s, the 70s? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not quite that old, you see. That was more in the 1980s. 
And, and you would have been about how old were you then? Uh, hard to say. I guess I was in my twenties around that period of time. I don't remember exactly when, when, uh, when we would have seen him around sometime in the eighties, but so we would all been around about in our, in our twenties, I believe. Yeah. And, and I was just asking because the photos, I, I'm trying to figure out if that's him. Oh yeah. No, I know. I, I these photos are, are familiar to me. I, I, I definitely knew most of those guys later on, but I, I, I wasn't around in the scene quite when I think these were taken. Okay. Now, from what I can tell, I, I, you know, I sent you that, the image of that, that card. And uh, from what I can tell, I think it says, I've been trying to figure out what it says, but it says something on the back, like uh, something about this. It's either the small love from the smallest, but, or maybe the slowest Seder was solitaire member of the Seders. Well, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he was a member exactly. He was just kind of around, you know, he'd, he'd stand around and smoke and have a beer. And I guess some of the other men knew him a little bit better. You know, I, I think obviously they must've been having, having sex with him at some point. He was hanging around, of course. So I assume that must have came to pass, but I, I don't, I, I, I mean, I never told him to, fuck off or get away because he wasn't a member but he, you know he ha had to pedal so hard just to catch up with us <laughs> i don't know if you could call him a member of the satyrs because mm. uh but you know he could he could have been a buddy rider if he wanted to he, he wasn't ugly that's for sure but <laughs> you know when you know when plans changed he was just kind of shit out of luck you know nobody had the the internets and the messages like they like the we got these days you know if if we changed our plan he would have just not you know who wouldn't have known couldn't have caught up so you know these days now we just use all the messages it's much much easier to stay coordinated but he was accepted generally oh yeah oh yeah he i mean no one told him to get lost or nothing. He wasn't rejected, but mostly we just let him hang out. And then, you know, when we rode off, we'd kind of just leave him behind. And he'd say he'd catch up, you know, eventually, <laughs> but sometimes it would, maybe sometimes it wouldn't. But uh, that card, that card thing, that was him. All right. He'd take it. He'd take those bicycle playing cards and stick them in his spokes to make it sound like a motorcycle, you know, like <laughs> kind of flapping away right, there right. in the spokes. But he was, he was quite a character. I guess he, he must have gave it to, that card to someone there. Any idea who he might have given that card to? They had like a boyfriend uh, in, in the membership or something like that? Yeah, I, well, I feel like I think he was maybe kind of close to Drew, but Drew, you know, done passed away during the AIDS pandemic right. there. So I'm not, I couldn't tell you for sure. And and so what, do, any idea what happened to Solitaire? Is there any chance he's still around? You know, I couldn't tell you. I don't know where he went. We didn't see him at, uh, at Badger Flat of, or any of the, the runs there afterwards he was just kind of there he was around and then one day he wasn't as you can tell from that clip mighty matt was eager to share information <laughs> i had not wanted to assume that solitaire was a man but one could gather by the way mighty matt talked about him that he was after a few beers shared over zoom matt's memory was jogged he explained that gay villain was the name of solitaire's bike Despite being a pedal bike, it was remarkably fast and had a Sturmy Archer gear shifting mechanism that allowed for six speeds. The handlebars were decorated with black leather tassels and the strangest detail about the bike, Matt noted Matt into his third beer, was that the bike had a bulbous tank between the seat and handlebars, which in the words of Mighty Matt, didn't carry no gas. I decided to focus my efforts on the 80s to try and find this gay man named Solitaire, now confident that it was a man I was searching for. I lost that confidence when I found this. Had I not been obsessed with that outline, the frame of the strange chopper styled bicycle and all too familiar black and white panniers, I likely would have missed it. 
Perhaps too, it was the gaze of the body of the sorry the buddy rider to Solitaire's right, which directed me to their half hidden form behind the photo's punctum, the mirror reflecting the riders, uh, the, with that sort of glamorous and hard gaze. This photo was taken in 1989 during a Dykes on Bikes Pride Run. By the late 80s, a tradition had cemented itself for participants of Dykes on Bikes, a name which has since become a registered trademark, uh, whose task was to lead pride parades and dyke marches. Dykes on Bikes began like the Satyrs and their brethren in the mid 1970s as an act of recreation and community building that carved out space for homosexual society where none existed. But in the case of Dykes on Bikes, the movement was less about escaping than it was about being recognized, seen, and heard. As the early marshals of the demonstrations that would become the Pride Parade, Dykes on Bikes were creating space through sound and movement in plain sight. After a bit of messaging and calling around, I was lucky to find a member who had actually met Salter, or as she called him, Saul. Here's a clip of my phone interview with Blaze responding to the 1989 photo. Do you remember this photo? Hell yeah, I remember that photo. I was there that day, but they never show the photos with me in it. To this day, no one wants to look at an older bull dyke. I mean, that's the thing. You're looking for this one woman, and there were so many of us that never got our picture taken. Sheila Malone made a documentary, but you Google it and you can't see it. Frameline's got the one with the satyrs. There's like five of them in that club left. They're history. Guess who survived? We did. We did because we were organizing more than just bar crawls and sex parties. We have diverse young members. We have an active website. We have nine chapters in four different countries today. That's because we bring in fresh blood. Sometimes one of the core members goes through her garage and sends out photos in an email. And that's how the images circulate that inspires young women to be involved. So is that Solitaire's bicycle in the photo? Oh, no question about it. That was a great pride run. That was one of the few times Sol actually kept up with us. What do you mean, kept up? Well, we told her she was going to have to ditch the bicycle. Bikes meant motorbikes, not whatever that thing was. We wanted her there. She was kind of standoffish, but she had grit, and she was just a decent person, and that's all the club was ever about. Good times, good people. But we couldn't be waiting for her. It just kind of dragged everybody down. So we got her a loaner bike. Eileen lent her this little Honda S50 her ex-girlfriend told her she had to get out of the basement. It was 10 years old, but it was cute as hell. Great shape, great starter scooter, real easy ride. Those things are worth money now, too. Bet Eileen wishes she hung on to it. I saw one on Craigslist the other day. I have a habit. I'll be the first to admit it. They wanted 1500 bucks for it. Didn't even run. Did Solitaire take to the scooter? Oh, no. No, no, no. She did not. Said it was way too fast. We were like, excuse me? We were all on hogs, which aren't exactly speed machines, and we just wanted Saul to keep up. Inclusion, right? Nope, it was too fast. I don't think any of the gals ever said it to her face, but if you can't handle a little 50cc scooter, how are you ever going to move up from that? What happened after that? Well, she was at the Lex most nights, didn't always talk with us. It was kind of weird. She wanted to be there, but didn't want to talk. Joe was this butch, who I think they might have slept together. I don't know that the two of them dated her in solitaire. Joe didn't really date. It wasn't her thing. Well, I guess he, Joe, did the transition thing maybe five years back. Personally, I think 65 is too old. It's my opinion, and I'm entitled to it. But then my niece heard me say that, and she just threw it right back in my face. You're never too old. Okay, okay. So I guess I'm the old one. Shoot me. So Joe knew Solitaire. Well, I wouldn't say anyone knew Solitaire. I don't know that Solitaire wanted to be known. Blaze's information in hand, I set out looking for Solitaire again. This time I poured over the archives looking for a dyke either on a bike named the Gay Villain or on a 50cc scooter from the late 70s. 
I found this fantastic image of a dyke on a bike, a Honda to be specific, but when I sent it to Blaze, she replied that it was not solitaire and that the photo was sure to have been taken in an earlier dykes on bikes era. In the 90s, solitaire seemed to fade away. Their disappearance from the archives seemed to follow a significant shift in the, to neoliberalism that deeply shaped what homophobia and transphobia look like today. I found two pieces of ephemera whose historical subtext speaks volumes about the shifting nature of pride parades and the moment when police forces and white gays and lesbians, once political enemies, began to find overlap. Here we can see an article by Leatherfoot contributor Wiki Stamps reporting on bike on bike activity during 1990 Pride celebrations. It includes both moments of gay and lesbian delight and also interesting commentary on New York's, quote, brooding police force in comparison to Boston's, quote, unusually unusual, affable cops. A year later, in infamously conservative San Diego, I know I live there long enough to attend two very corporate, very police prides, a disgruntled sister biker leveled a critique at the registration practices, demanding the city, quote, get with the 90s. I thought these two articles said a lot about the ways in which the Pride Parade was really morphing into less of a protest and more towards the family-friendly event it was for most of the early aughts. This would give way to the corporate event, which has been deeply critiqued in the past two or so years in the light of the Black Lives Matter movement and the resurgence of the trans rights movement. My sifting through archival ephemera eventually led me to scholarly essays written by, about Dykes on Bikes. Something I'd heard along the way was that one of the reasons that Dykes on Bikes rode in the front of the parade was to keep the bikes from overheating while idling behind slower, uh, which you know, would happen if they were idling behind slower moving floats and marchers. This was in part one of the things that led to them often being the leaders in a pride parade or the dyke march. The question of parades, protests, and sound led me back to Sheila Malone, the artist who'd made the film Blaze referred to, who also wrote a wonderful paper on this very topic. Malone talks about the ways in which a motorcycle disrupts and brings visibility or aurality, uh, it's, you know, presence of sound through its engine sounds and it presents this as both a sign of empowerment or disempowerment, depending on the group of bikers. Malone discusses dykes on bikes, but also gives an example of a thin blue line counter protest staged during the execution of Daniel Lopez, charged with killing a cop. The cops were there to drown out anti-death penalty protesters and so that, as a thin blue line supporter himself said on a Facebook Posted uh, post cited by Malone, quote, the last thing that the murderer will hear as he enters the gates of hell is the roar of our bikes, end quote. This impressed me again with the ways in which motorcycle cultures oscillate with and against law enforcement politics, patriotism, and the state. Another interesting work of scholarship I found with Dykes on Bikes was a very physical one. Dr. Anna DeJong, who works, whose work revolves around tourism and human geography, articulates the very tacit and embodied uh, power that Dykes on Bikes has as a social gesture in uh, physical motion. In Dykes on Bikes, mobility, belonging, and the visceral, DeJong makes a case for the visceral methodology that Dykes on Bikes offers. I want to suggest uh, that writing is a visceral Oh, sorry, this is the, so this is, um, this is uh, De Jong's uh, paper, quote from De Jong's paper. I want to suggest that writing is a visceral experience because it brings senses into being. For example, one has to remain aware of their own writing body. Now, how it is positioned on the road, its positionality towards other writing bodies and other driving bodies. In this sense, writing bodies open up and connect in different ways at different times for different reasons. Exploring the visceral realm of writing thus provides understanding of the ways members of the Dykes on Bikes are positioned in relation to others, providing an entry point to explore political understanding of how people can be moved or mobilized either as individuals or as groups of social actors. Dijon goes on to discuss how belonging is complicated by the intersection of Dykes on Bikes rides and the Pride Parade, uh, in her actually quite beautifully written paper, De Jong draws on anecdotes from members talking about the mechanics and skills of writing in groups and the ways in which these experiences create both division and inclusion through the demands of belonging to a group of cyclists. I think at this point, I would have been happy to lose myself in contemporary research and theorizing about dykes on bikes. It felt good to be tracing a group into the present, to watch videos of pre-pandemic 2019 dykes on bikes pride runs, I would have been content to let Solitaire go until I received an email from Joe. 
Joe informed me that he had held on to three of Solitaire's riding tops, two vests, and something Joe referred to as a va jacket, and that he would send them to me as uh, he was trying to, you know, he was doing the, the minimalist lifestyle thing. Uh, what with, I think he had like six roommates and he was trying to stay in the Bay Area. I replied eagerly, giving Joe my address and asking all kinds of questions about Solitaire. I didn't get an email back, but a few weeks later, I did receive a box with about 12 stamps and a great deal of packing tape. The Dacus and Vests were stunning and also very hard to place historically. I put on some archive handling gloves and took photos of the vests and the jacket and posted them to the popular vintage antique clothing forum, the Fedora Lounge, where I received a great deal of mixed opinions. The style of the jacket was decidedly old, likely somewhere between the First and Second World Wars. But the lining of the jacket was unmistakably 70s. It had likely been refined, relined at some point. Uh, the style was odd, too, in that it was somewhere, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in that it was somewhere between a man and woman style jacket. And the buttons seemed to have been moved to the right at some point, or perhaps it was a double-breasted jacket, unclear. And it took me a second, but in photographing the back of the jacket, I finally realized what Joe meant by the jacket. I can commented this uh, to the forum, but they didn't appreciate the joke. Uh, they just said it was like a pleat that allowed mobility. I don't know. Uh, another, another, uh, the other, one of the other vests was this awesome um, queer evil vest here that uh, I also posted about on the forum, but then the, the guys on that forum were like, no, it's obviously a, a contemporary Clio vest. And I wasn't sure what that, you know, what that meant for, for solitaire. Uh, the next vest that was really, really, th th this is one of my favorites here is um, this vest that immediately uh, put me in mind of something uh, that I had seen. And so I had to sift through my own personal archive and I f found what I was looking for, a post from, wouldn't you know it, 2012. Um, in 2012, my partner and I had gone to see the Oakland Museum of California's 1968 exhibit. And this had been my favorite item on display. I'll read you the, this is what the plaque said at the museum. Jody Ballou wore this vest during the occupation of Alcatraz Island in 1969, a year later at another occupation six miles west of Davis, California, in which 60, 637 acres were claimed and occupied at Pitt River in Northern California with the Pitt River Indians were uh, at a standoff with local electric company and then at Wounded Knee in 1973. Uh, an enrolled member of the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians, Ballou says, the vest was designed by a friend from Alaska, painted by a Dakota, and worn by Anishinaabe Kwai. Uh, and then she, refer she refers to the vest as the, a United Nations vest. The occupation of Alcatraz uh, was roughly a year and a half uh, long demonstration where indigenous students and activists camped on Alcatraz Island located in the San Francisco Bay uh, following the closing of an indigenous cultural resource center in the Bay Area. Um, when the penitentiary closed down, uh, activist Belva Cotier wrote an article saying, well, why doesn't the federal government just you know, hand back the, that the, the island, uh, given that the federal government is technically under legally binding treaties. Um, and of course, that idea was turned down and that led to the organizing even a 400 person occupation, um, which gained a lot of attention, but then unfortunately was steadily dismantled by the FBI and by local police. I tried following this thread to find more about solitaire and did not find much. However, I did find uh, this uh, image uh, from around the same era. This is an image from the 1970 Chicano moratorium. Um, and this was a, a huge protest, a kind of key moment in the Chicano movement where um, I think about somewhere between 20,000 and 3,000 people marched to protest um, the Vietnam War, the way the draft was targeting uh, minority youth, and then the police brutality that was being experienced in Black and Latino neighborhoods uh, in response to that resistance. In this photo, you can see Solitaire, uh, but they're kind of there, on, but the same, you know, they're on this lowrider style bicycle, not the gay villain. Um, the lowrider style bicycle actually began as a 
a kind of child bike in the 1960s, but then was adopted as a, as, a, as a bike style, like a muscle bike style by Chicano street culture and continues to be a cultural object. Um, so I, I really like in this photo how <laughs> this person is having just a very joyous reaction to seeing uh, solitaire on that bicycle. So, you know, you remember that the, I, I, I'm going to be, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to go about five minutes over. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, everyone. Um, so I, you will recall that I mentioned that leather has this property of molding to the body, right? And so I, I thought, well, what if I can recreate, use, somehow use, you know, some kind of 3D modeling software to recreate what solitaire might have looked like based on the descriptions that I'd heard and, you know, the, um, these jackets, these vests. So here we see a uh, male presenting solitaire, again, just sort of a theorizing of what uh, solitaire might have looked like. And here we see a theorizing of what a female presenting solitaire might have looked like. A feeling that I had enough information to start putting together all the pieces, and I decided to put together this timeline um, very quickly. Uh, you can see, you know, solitaire appearing with the satyrs, and uh, you know, in in tandem with these these events here, then solitaire appearing in the Sylvan Rand series. You can see here, so we've you know we've got the draft. We've got we have Stonewall happening in 1969. We have um, the occupation of Alcatraz here, and the Chicano Mortorium. That's an error. It's actually 1970. Um, then Dykes on Bikes in the 80s. The AIDS epidemic here, kind of in tandem with that. And then all the way up to when the WOW 2 shop closes. So that, I, I really thought I had a hold on what had happened, that I had a good sense until I got a letter from Joe. And the letter contained a, a, this note and two photos. The note, by the way, says, moving to Sackdown and found these, note the jacket. The photos basically wrecked my whole theory of, of what I thought I knew. The first photo shows solitaire, face visible, somewhat feminine, wearing what is unmistakably the jacket. Uh, you can see, if you look closely, you can see the, uh, the button dimples. You can see the leather tie here on the lapel. Uh, the photo is obviously taken taken in the 19, early 1900s, well before the birthday I had figured for solitaire. Um, and the next photo was taken around the same era. There again is solitaire, but this time with a full beard. Same jacket. You can you know the cuff is there. Same jacket and a, a totally diff very very sort of different gender presentation. How was this possible? The gay villain was not pictured. Uh, but maybe this was before the gay villain. Had I gotten Solitaire's age wrong? But it just, it just didn't make sense. I was baffled. And for several nights, I lay counting years, revaluing my information. I tried calling Joe, but he had eventually changed his number. Had I been tricked, was it possible that these were fakes? Who would do such a thing? Had I somehow tricked myself? Had I convinced myself into believing the story? So in the end, I, there was only two two possible answers. The first possibility was that this was a hoax. Either Solitaire and this rich and exhaustive archive, which we've seen here today, was a falsity, a lie, a despicable and indeed a pitiable project, likely concocted by an obsessive and depraved, depraved provocateur who painstakingly left a trail of false breadcrumbs, indeed gluten-free breadcrumbs leading to a trap for us, hungry for answers from the archive to fall into, an unabashed and sickening cavorting with history and mishandling of fact, an egregious attempt to undermine truth now in this moment when our hold on what is real and what is not is so very tenuous or or the other possibility was that solitaire was and perhaps is a time traveler in this case solitaire would likely be using their bicycle as a time machine how we cannot begin to guess uh, but using it to queer hop from run to ride to protest on some grand tour of key moments and movements in queer their story. Which of these two 
is it? The answer is, we may never know. The satyrs use the motorcycle as a tool of fugitivity to escape scrutiny. The dykes on bikes use motorcycles as a tool for empowerment, visibility, and organizing. And motorcycles have been and continue to be symbols of gender, class, and sexual rebellion, as well as symbols of the police state. Is it possible that a bicycle fashioned to look like a motorcycle was or is for solitaire a time machine? An essential accoutrement in a temporal drag act? Had I, through finding Solitaire's card, time traveled myself? Desire for a person, for a body, for an experience, for a way of life has been a driving force in my life and I think in the lives of many queers. The act of longing for an idea of the past turns desire into a time machine. This desire-powered time machine temporarily splits or prisms the desire who longs towards a future that is the past from the place of the present. It is a problematic and somewhat dangerous time machine because it does not transport you fully to any one time. Rather, it leaves you fractured, a specter inhabiting many times at once. In his book, Cruising Utopia, Jose Esteban Munoz speaks politically, spatially, and temporally when he says that queerness is not yet here, meaning that queerness lives in the act of reaching for queerness. I think about this a lot. Queerness, it seems, is a ghost we are haunted by, a ghost of something that has not yet died. Was Solitaire a hoax, a brazen trolling not only of the archive, but a trolling of history itself? Or was Solitaire a time traveler whose mysterious pedal-powered time travel technology transported them from decade to decade so that they could experience it all? We may never know. In closing, I can only say that the only way this can be proven is if we collectively continue to search for solitaire in our queer present, in our queer future, and deep within our own queer selves. You just never know when the gay villain may ride again. Wow. Um, <laughs> thank you um, for that. Um... I think I was into. Um, I think. Uh, <laughs> oh, my video works again. Oh, it's working! God, <laughs> we finally got there, did we? <laughs> um, yes, you might have noticed Hannah had to turn um, the camera off halfway through that because they were laughing so much. <laughs> um, what I will do is I will open this up now, of course, to. Um, Susanna and you for, discuss, for um, discussion. What I'm going to suggest um, whilst you're talking, um, if, I, if I suggest that you two basically ignore the chat, but I think the chat would be a really good opportunity for people to ask questions. Um, we're gonna have a 10 minute, 15 minute maybe discussion between Suzanne and um, Miguel Zinta. And um, then we're gonna have a five minute break, which will give people a bit more time, accessibility break, et cetera. And then we'll have some Q and A with the, um, the audience if that's okay so if people want to pop their questions in the chat um and then i will be kind of feeding back if that's okay so over to you two um, okay, well, we oh, oh, <laughs> i just i before we get started suzanne i just have to share yeah. um the one comment the only sorry only one comment that I, the rest i will leave for other people for for our wonderful yeah. hosts to to translate but i just saw my mom my mom <laughs> just commented uh, that there should be a solitaire tarot or oracle deck. And I, I agree, yeah. I agree. So pre-orders now, um, <laughs> send, send your money. Suzanne. 100%, oh my friend, that was so good. <laughs> Spectacular, playful. Um, I love that you link to broader social struggles, land, Alcatraz, Vietnam. Um, I feel I have a lot to digest. Um, so I, I do want to start with one question around methodology, actually. Yeah, um, sure. And so, and that is kind of, and we, you and I had, you know, we've done a little talking about this before, but what counts as queer evidence and what counts as proof? Because um, we know queerness has a complicated and uneasy relationship to evidence. 
Um, so how do you get at the historical facts of queer lives, sure. which is, I think what this is about, but also the way the evidence quote of queerness can be used to discipline um, queer people, queer lives, totally. sex connections, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking about, and you had raised this term with me, kind of the bad academic or the academic villain uh, with respect to your methodology that kind of wants to create or construct an archive of queerness and a method of queer worlding. Um, so Instagram, Pinterest, uh, maybe Blazon, Mighty Matt are people we don't know, um, kind of making things up while attending to ephemera, the trace, the trail end of things, the shadows, what lingers in, in photographs, um, basements, Craigslist ads, uh, what you call your cavalier citations, the unreliable <laughs> source in a way, yeah. right? I think are ways of actually querying evidentiary proof. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right? yes. so I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, I was, I, I was thinking uh, that I, I think camp is like a, a big part of this, right? You know, I feel yeah. like I always feel like um, structures of academic structures and yeah, um, conventions are so serious, right? They're so serious. I, in my practice in general, I really love pushing against that seriousness and the result is pretty campy oftentimes. Um, I, I think also like, uh, you know, it comes from uh, a methodology of fandom and, and, mm -hmm. and love. I was thinking as I was presenting how this, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm, I'm very insecure about people being offended that I have, you know, that I have maligned this history in some way, but this is a love letter to this history, yeah. right? Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I, I feel like this is an effort to, to get beyond, I don't know, get beyond the security guard that's keeping me from, you know, from my, my idols, right? Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 love, I love the sloppy archive <laughs> um, because, I mean, I, a very interesting thing was that as I was putting together these images was I was like, I had a moment where I was like, wait, am I, am I already working with a fake image? Like I had moments where I was like, wait, is this, was that, uh, that also a writer like Photoshopped in or, you know, is this the right cat? You know, all of these things, it's the right year. It was, it was very, I, I, it was funny because I, I began feeling very lazy, feeling that, oh, I was just being lazy and getting all my, my images from Pinterest. But then, you know, when I, you know, was, was accessing the, um, I used, you know, my university access to get to these essays and it, it's so different, right? It's so different. It's so sanitized. It's such a sanitized way of receiving information. And I understand from like, in, like the ethics around it, right? And again, you know, this, this, there's a precarity about truth, right? Mm -hmm. Which we are very much engaging with right now uh, in this sort of, in this sort of post-truth era. But, um, but I feel like, you know, I, I kind of, it, I, I kind of wanted the, my methodology for this to also, to, to as a performance, kind of also set up the viewer to experience a like uh, uh, a critical thinking process of like, well, wait, this is no man, this is fake, you know, and then and perhaps be like, well, is it fake? I don't know. I'm sure you know. It depends from person to person, right? And and all the emotions that kind of come with it. All of this, I think, is part of that the messiness that one, when one is, you know, engaging with these very ephemeral, very unreliable, um, sometimes villainous sources. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, that in some ways just at, um, capture so much also what queerness is, right? The messiness of Absolutely. it, Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, you know, we... Just, go ahead. Just very quickly that, you know, I think that there is even within ourselves, within one individual, the queerness, the sort of self making that you, that you make within an academic conference yeah. is ra or an academic yeah. context yeah. is radically different from the queer selfing that you do yeah. outside of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I also meant to say at the beginning, I loved your kind of archival gesture to um, Audre Lorde about looking inside ourselves. I don't know if that was, if that was actually a reference to her. 
to her. Mm, work. No, I um, forgot yeah. about that. But okay, I mean, it's. I'm sure it's in there. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and it's also interesting that at the beginning, and I, I was like, because I, I knew where this was going to go, whether this was part of the performance or an actual apology um, that you needed to apologize for, for the kind of history and your lack of academic training in history. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as, as, as I said, it was, it was a brazen trolling of history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, just something you said about the... About, um, a love letter to this history because I was actually thinking about love and erotics of this within this performance and within mm -hmm. bike culture and especially Dykes on Bikes which is kind of a little bit where my heart lies and um, so I was reading Natalie Lovelace's uh, book um, which I don't on, on research creation sorry I don't have the mm -hmm. title right with me and she actually has this term called polydisciplinary polydisciplinary oh yeah which yeah. is a way critiquing disciplinary specialization and reframing mm -hmm. like the serial monogamy of interdisciplinary, totally. interdisciplinarity. Um, and so she writes about, you know, so polydisciplinary is a way that we can approach how we do, how we think about and how we think with our research practices. Mm -hmm. And so that it's a term that can open up like the question of who, disciplinary speaking, we will fall for, um, as well as how we will fall and when we will fall. Um, yeah. So being promiscuously curious and really bringing, she writes, bringing arrows back into the grain of, of research creation. So I was really happy to just hear you say that this is really about a, a love letter. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, and I was also thinking as I was watching about the arrows and the erotics of this performance and um, in terms of its disruption, but also the lure. I think at one point you used the word, the magicalness of this, the longing, um, like bikes, dykes on bikes is definitely an erotic, right? The, the visceral methodology you uh -huh. call the transport. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think we can, uh, uh, this is, a, th yeah, this question is important to me, particularly from a, a like performance yeah. artist perspective, yeah. you know, because, you know, you, you're receiving this, uh, this as a sort of, as a PowerPoint presentation, right, where I've used the form of the PowerPoint presentation, but these photos that, you know, th I've layered myself into these photos, and when I took those photos, I had, you know, I, I often take all my own photos, so I actually had to ride you know, two good sites um, that I felt I could easily overlay onto other sites. You know, and the landscape here is very different from the landscapes that I used in those photos, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, the, you know, I, so I rode, I have that, that chopper pedal bicycle is yeah. actually my bicycle, Gay Villain, it's, it's my baby. Um, <laughs> and uh, I would take my, I would like balance my tripod and my camera with me ride it out to the place, set up the camera and do this thing where I had to run back and forth from the bicycle to the camera, right? To, to take a bunch of selfies. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that in, in this performance, there was a certain amount of moving. And so when in De Jong's paper, uh, like, you know, she's talking about this, uh, you know, kind of amazing um, uh, uh, movement, kind of magical moving and, and relating to others by being in a group of writers, you know, um, I, I feel like that, you know, I kind of lean towards that, you know, I'm like, oh, like, what is that experience like? Mm -hmm. I am not having that experience on my, you know, I'm in a different kind of vehicle and I'm not, I'm by myself, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah, I think that that's, that, that, yeah. Does that, does that kind of like yeah. answer I mean, it, your yeah. question? Yeah. And then, I mean, I also ask these questions for other for other people to engage. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess my last one, because I also just I'm not tracking the chat, so it's too overwhelming. But um, I, it's one more thing I was thinking of, and then I would love to bring everyone in. And and I'm glad you kind of referenced Elizabeth Freeman. Um, so thinking about queer inheritance and generational time, um, and kind of bringing this queer ancestry in a way in, into your performance and thinking of inheritance, um, not in terms of like the transfer of private property along, you know, hetero right. reproductive lines, but as a 
inheritance as a collective legacy, I guess, yeah, um, totally. from which to imagine and, and engage in queer worlding. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking like Dykes on Bikes is, you know, a point of arrival. I mean, it has been for me, right? And one, yes. one, and I'm thinking about Sarah Ahmed's work here, right? Like a, one line that we are given as a point of arrival, let's say, into mm -hmm. a form of lesbian subculture, right? And and so returning to this history as product as a productive resource for mm -hmm. the present and and the future, right? Living ways of being, politics. And so I guess I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that, but then maybe sure. perhaps a little bit more academic, serious question, given our location, you and I, and some people in, in the audience here. Um, and that is when you were um, kind of doing your, your, your reading on Dykes on Bikes, um, is there any conversation around um, kind of the settler politics of writing and thinking about mobility, at the same time, there's, you know, the land back movement just is this settler politics or is it, is it spectral, <laughs> I guess. Right. Yeah. Totally. Oh man. Okay. It's a lot there. Well, yeah, so sorry. first of all, in terms of the, in terms of, you know, it's, it's a good, a lot, um, right. in terms of the, you know, the, the questions of inheritance. Um, well, I mean, I thought like halfway through this project, I was like, why, why don't I actually talk to some like real living archives, like some real people, but I did not, you know, I did not. And you know, I think that that became a conscious choice in this project because, you know, I feel like there, you know, there is that that is a kind of, of project. Right. Um, and I would love to, you know, speak to like you know, queer elders. But, you know, also also, the, you know, there's this this project was a, a sort of um, a project of self envisioning. Right. Mm. Within within a history. Um, and I think, and as also as very, I think, you know, the, the, I, as I was sort of, you know, figuring out this project, found my, found myself in a kind of tension, a very trans, trans tension between the history of like the satyrs and the dykes and bikes, right? Where you do have, I mean, you know, they're, they're just two very differently gendered um, cultures as a whole, right? It's not even about presentation necessarily. It's just about culture. It's about what, what, like, the relation the gendered relationships to what the yeah. bikes were you know yeah. um and yeah. i you know i yeah. i you know in terms of dykes on bikes i was like i mean i was a dyke you know until about age 25 that is how i identified yeah. and um and so it was interesting like um you know kind of replaying that experience right yeah. from moving from moving you know f through these different identities and in, and seeing how Dykes and Bikes, you know, kind of formulated itself, um, mm -hmm. I think that I, you know this is this is kind of related, I think, to 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 like settler politics. Is that I was actually really surprised of how, uh, in at least in my research, I saw uh, you could see, through the history of queer motorcycling mm -hmm. or gay and lesbian motorcycling, you could kind of see these histories of demonstration, protest, yeah. uh, neoliberalism, um, and, you know, relationship, you know, GLBTQ, you know, plus mm -hmm. relationship to policing and police yeah. forces kind mm -hmm. of unfolding there, right? And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, and I think that, you know, in the, I believe it's one of the satyrs says in the, in, in the, in Scott Bloom's film talks about how, um, how the, the motorcycle clubs kind of dissolved once you know it was okay to be at a bar right and you weren't gonna get you know your ass beaten right when you like you know when you were just trying to hang out and so then it was like there was you know yes there's like the the aids like uh, like epidemic also had a big effect but there was that that was a huge part of that culture shift was the decriminalization process so you know and i you know i think that 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 is a very interesting thing about how yeah. about comfortable versus uncomfortable territorialization mm -hmm. right like are you comfortable in a place yeah. right it's not yeah. even a question of who does it belong to quite but it is a question of well who mm -hmm. who is the space for and how mm -hmm. is it mapped right mm -hmm. thank you thank you okay. oh. <laughs> <laughs> so much to think about yeah. If it's okay with everyone, then, if that was kind of one of the last questions, what I'm going to suggest we do is we just take a, a five minute just accessibility break. 